Okay, this is the Music Maestro podcast. Um, I'm here once again with another former Ministry of Sound colleague. It seems to be the kind of pattern with this podcast at the moment. I can only seem to get people I used to work with at Ministry. Um, this time around, we've got Lewis, Lewis Newson. Um, you've got a hell of a career, mate, that we're going to um, we're going to we're going to get into. But actually, I'm going to just go straight in um, in terms of your uh, early years um, when you were growing up in Great Yarmouth. What was your what was your favourite song as a kid? Like, what was your uh, what was your memory of like a first song that you think? Yeah, okay, yeah. It depends how far you want to go back. Um, right, I mean, we go, we as, go like way back as early as you can remember. Yeah, okay. So uh, the earliest thing I can remember is like my dad playing Bon Jovi in the car, like proper like rock power, like power yeah, ballad, solid. Like yeah, screaming that out in the back seat. It was a vibe. <laughs> particular was there a particular track? I mean, it will be one of the, like an always, one of the, oh, one of the absolute shit. belters. Okay, <laughs> yeah. fine, man. Serious stuff. Um, is is it to, is it your parents then that are sort of uh, responsible for you kind of pursuing music? Yeah, 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 yeah. My my like parents' love of music, I think, as is ever the case, has kind of like formed my taste. And then I started playing guitar at like ten, and that I did that all through my teens, and I went into uni to study music, and it's just kind of you know, taking me from there. Well, let's go, let's get, let, so education then. I mean, you've, you've done a, you've done a degree, right? Yep. A degree in, 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 in popular music performance at Thames Valley University. Yes. And then went and did a master's in yeah. music business management. Yeah, love it. Like, <laughs> why? Why? Yeah, good question. Um, I think I got to the end of my degree and realised that, a lot of my friends were kind of going off to be in like function bands and you know it, it, it which like no disrespect on that but I, I didn't see myself doing that as a lot of travel you have to give up a lot of your spare time to, to live that life so you see yourself doing what exactly uh so i, I was playing guitar so it's yeah. like you'd be part of like a band yeah. going to play like weddings or like that kind of stuff and it was like a good way to earn like a solid income mm. through being a working musician yeah um but I, I just didn't, I, I like having my weekends, I like having my free time, yeah. so it's like, not for me. So, you know, we did a module in the last year of my uni course on music business, which mm -hmm. I really enjoyed. Um, so I just spoke to the tutor on that. And he was like, look, you can just apply for internships at, at labels, and that's a good way in. That's and what you, and that's that's what you what did, did, right? Yeah, that's what I did. Okay, so I've got a question. Sure. Because uh, I, I did the same. I did, a, I did a, a degree in music industry management. Um not at Westminster at Buck Chilterns, but mm. um, like it definitely led me to the path that I'm mm. at now, basically. Yeah. But I do wonder when I'm looking at university ed education for the music industry, mm. if you're up and cut like a kid coming mm. through and you've done college and you're looking at what to do next, if you want to pursue a career in the music industry, is it worth going to university or not? Um, I don't think you need to. Because I, I mean, I, I, my, 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 the reason I ask that yeah. is because I look back sometimes and I wonder: should I've just got straight into the industry yeah. and then had that three or four year head start on the people that do go to university? Yeah, the same it's, year? it's true. I, I I don't think you need to. I I, I think about it a lot as well. Like, <laughs> like, like, <laughs> Keeps you up at four night. years of my life. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it, it, because you know, having been in a position where I've had to hire people to come into teams, it, it's like. You go through a lot of CVs. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. You quickly learn about what's important through that process. And actually, I think it's just about the passion, showing like experience, but experience that you've, you've gone out in there and got yourself. Like, totally. Like, ha having the degree is great. If you have that music business thing, brilliant. Like, that's not a bad thing. But no, like, no, no, no. I don't think it puts you in a better stead than someone who's gone out and like managed an artist for a year. And, like, yeah. That way, or like book gigs for their SU or. I, do you I, know what I mean? It, yeah, I think if it's like you say, if it's coupled with a lot of kind of extracurricular activity, yeah, you, you, you definitely need setting that. up your own you, label, being a yeah. DJ, whatever it may be, because well, like, it's, it's hyper competitive. So I think yeah. you need to have that thing that gives you the edge, and and if you can show that you've gone out there and off your own back, yeah, done stuff, then yeah. Okay, so yeah, that was so 2008 to 2011 was was when you did that degree, mm. which is also the same time. <laughs> <laughs> that you listed, you list yourself as a freelance musician. Now I'm going to touch on this because I I didn't know this before about a couple of hours ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you were a session guitarist on UK and European tours. You performed live on radio, BBC Radio Two. Yeah. 
but also on TV, yeah. on The X Factor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you've got here that you supported ar artists such as Tom Jones, Ed Sheeran, and Kelly Rowland. Yeah. <laughs> what the... What? Yeah, so the, the, the X Factor thing was really fun. I, I, was, I did it like four or five times. And, and as part of the band that stands behind the contestant. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Like, not to like... Yeah. pull the veil down but we yeah. weren't actually playing um, <laughs> you weren't like, getting the golden buzzer no no exactly <laughs> they're like he looks like a generic guitar player bring him in yeah yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah I, I met the, the just so as everything happens in the music industry just kind of met the guy who booked the, the band um, through like a, an artist I was playing with at the time and then got the call a few weeks later like do you want to come do X Factor on Saturday and and then that led to like three or four more times it, it, was, it was a lot of fun uh, and so but is that why then you were supporting those artists I mentioned? No, so so that was a different thing where I was like playing with an artist. So like the wording is probably like I, I was playing for an artist who was supporting those artists. You've twisted so, the word. I see what I you've done there. I haven't twisted it. You've fluffed it, it up. It's, it's you know, it, okay. it reads well, but yeah. it's, um, <laughs> I think it's open to interpretation. Yeah, sure. Okay. That, that's, you, you put that meaning on it, not me. Fine. Okay. Yeah, I see. I see. Okay, cool. So uh, yeah, I mean, that's massive. Um and so you were doing that in conjunction with your uni course. It was during that time that you decided you probably didn't want to pursue that as a career. Is that right? Yeah, I, I think as well, it's just you come to the realisation that you're probably not good enough <laughs> to do it. Oh, like, okay. Like, yeah. like, that's the thing, though. It's like, yeah. you know, you, you get to that level. And there were some incredible people on my course. And you, yeah. you look around and you're just like... I, I don't know. If I kind of thought that. that about football as a kid. I remember yeah. seeing Wayne Rooney score against. I think it was Arsenal as a sixteen-year-old, and I thought, right, I better pack it yeah, in now. Probably can do that. <laughs> um, okay, so then you, you after uni, you had a s various internships uh, yeah. at Warner Music, Kilimanjaro Live, and Universal Music, right? Yeah. Um, how did how did you get those? Because they were like for a few months at a time, right? Yeah, yeah. So I, th I think it, I don't know. It feels like around that time, you, internships were just a bit shorter because the 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 Warner and the Kilimanjaro thing were like th I think it was three three and three or three and six months. Yeah, I yeah. can't remember. Um, so yeah, the Warner thing was with Rhino. What, what, what right. was then called Rhino? Yeah, the catalog team. The, yeah. the catalog team. Yeah, just like general intern. So I, I just like hit up basically a ton of labels. Like emailed them just classic like yeah. here's my CV I love, love hustling yeah, yeah. And, and got a call back and then that led to the, like a bit of a marketing internship at Killy um, and then I got yeah like a 12 month thing as part of the research and insight team at Universal and, and that was again just like that, that was more of a traditional thing where like it was on their their careers was portal. that apprenticeship scheme uh, not an apprenticeship it, scheme, it was like, like a, it was kind like, of like an internship scheme that's metal like, yeah, but yeah, it was yeah. on their careers portal so I think it was you know yeah. you upload it and like you would a normal job so. right okay um, and then so straight from universal internship you then got your I guess first full time role in the music industry with Ministry of Sound Ministry yeah, yeah, yeah. and so that was in it, 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 digital sales or I think of it as just sales but was yeah. that because you were working on like the, the DSP side of things yeah exactly like right. I, I, I kind of I came in at like a junior level and then kind of worked up to a point where I was managing the like Spotify account Mm. And it was uh, the, I was the first person to have done that yeah. at ministry, right? So it was like a very new thing. Yeah, I remember yeah, yeah. it was also around the time that like there was a bit of bad blood between the two. Oh, ministry and Spotify. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Wow, that's uh, and yeah, it was iconic. a whole that was a whole time. Um, so yeah, the, the digital sales thing comes from it being like more streaming focused. How did you get that job? What the ministry job? Mm. Just like again, just applying and going through quite a rigorous interview process. Did you go? You didn't go. I mean, because we we had uh, my, Mike McNamee on yeah last week uh, or the week before maybe, mm. and he was talk <laughs> he was talking about his interview process yeah. that ended with Hector. Yeah, I don't yeah, know yeah, if of you course. Had, did yeah, you yeah. have the same thing? Yeah, yeah. Wow. Okay, I've, so, I've talked with him about that before. <laughs> okay, cool. So, but you passed. You got yeah. through the other yeah, end. Yeah, okay, yeah. and. Um, you you worked your way through up the like what the way up the ladder? Yeah, yeah. So I, I how did your like, role change? I guess from when you started to guess what, towards the end. Um, the well, I I think it was quite like when I came in, it, it was across that period where like Spotify was really starting to uh, become a, a a fixture. Yeah, in, like, yeah, the digital yeah. music landscape and mm -hmm. like like I remember like Daft Punk, Get Lucky. That was like the first track to break a million streams yeah. in a week, and everyone was like, "Oh my god!" Like, yeah, yeah. And yeah. it was that time, so I, I, it came from like us focusing a lot on, you know, driving pre-orders for like a Cigarla single, mm -hmm. and then by the time I left, it was like, okay, well, actually, what are we doing on like Spotify? How are we building relationships with Spotify yeah. and Deezer and all these streaming platforms now? Because yeah. that's where you know that's where the industry's going. 
you're involved in the kind of uh, the ministry playlisting side of stuff as well, right? So I guess yeah. that was uh, and that would have been at the point, obviously, where compilations was the kind of big deal for for the late for for Ministry of Sound recordings, mm. if, if you like. And obviously, all of a sudden, Spotify comes along and completely fucks that up, basically. Mm. Yeah. Um, and then there was a huge sort of, I guess. I guess transitional period where we were getting used to not selling the units that we were used to yeah. and having to put together effectively compilations in playlist form uh, and basically not get anything for it. Yeah. Um, how how were you? I, I mean, that must have been when it, we worked together. Yeah, right? we worked right? on that. So it was it, it was a it was a joint venture, I think, between both our teams because, like, obviously, being on the streaming side, we were like, okay, how, what do we do? How do we make ministry? And the the brand more of a presence on these platforms. We're kind of doing the playlist thing, but it you know it's kind of playing second fiddle to the the, the physical comps. And you know, what what how do we develop that strategy? And so kind of I worked with your guys' teams, kind of develop yeah the strategy. Yeah, <laughs> to yeah, use yeah, the same yeah, phrase yeah. again, and and like put put stuff in place that meant we were like actually focusing on it and like updating them weekly and yeah. branding it and and making it into a like a proper thing. You yeah, know, that we yeah, were doing yeah. On the platform. Cool. Okay. Um, so three years at Ministry of Sound before you jumped ship and went over to <laughs> Warner Music. I remember a lot of people used to go to Warner Music from, from the yeah. sales side of things. Yeah, I don't, yeah. might have that wrong. Um, or vice versa. Um, UK market analyst for streaming yeah. and playlists. Oh, explain that. What is that? Uh, so it was a role within the commercial team. Right. Um, and it was, without using the phrase in the answer uh like data data driven <laughs> looking at ways to understand the streaming market and like what like warner's records were doing what competitor records were doing right um feeding that information back into you know all the frontline labels yeah and, and helping them understand their approach um in short and what about i guess and what about the uh, that's not like for me that's on the streaming side but what about is this playlist here as well what are you doing on the playlist uh oh yeah so so uh, you know um i, I joined relatively shortly after i think Warner had acquired like topsify oh right and, Kieran and so, yeah, yeah, yeah 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 so it was kind of working with those guys as well to just again just supply data that shows like how well those playlists are performing what what tracks are in what tracks are out how do you tweak it and develop that strategy mm. and just like yeah so it was kind of more much more of a an informative role rather than a like strategic role okay so that lasts for about a year. Then you move over to cooking vinyl, I think, to begin with as a, as a yeah. digital marketing manager. Yeah. But eventually worked your way up to head of digital all yeah. day, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Um, and you're here. This is a big chunk. of. This is probably your longest It's my spell. longest role, I would say. Yeah, yeah. Six, just, good six years or nearly six years. Six years. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. Decent, yeah. Um, so I guess why did you... I, I didn't really ask it with ministry, but why did you leave Warner in that role? Mm -hmm. Um, to move over to cooking vinyl, you're in a you're in a major label. Mm. A lot of people breaking mm. into the industry is like working at major labels, like yeah, the, yeah. the thing. Um, and then you decide to to bin that off and, and go to cooking vinyl. <laughs> um, yeah, why did I do that? No, I, I so ba I made a decision to like I made the conscious decision to move into a more marketing or, or digital. Digital marketing was what was interesting to me, right? And um, it, like like I said before, it, you within a kind of analyst role. I, I actually think attitudes have changed toward analyst roles in the industry nowadays because data is yeah, yeah, always yeah, going to yeah. be growing in importance. But I think I, I just felt like I was just kind of putting information out there and then just not really seeing the fruits of it. And actually, I wanted to be the person on the other side of it. Yeah. So that's why I applied for the digital marketing role. And um, yeah, it was like very fortunate that they kind of took a, a bit of a punt on me, I think, at the time. <laughs> okay. Well, it seemed like to be the right punt because at the end of the day, you ended up <laughs> heading up the digital yeah. team there, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, Talk to us a bit about cooking vinyl because I guess um, they're, they're kind of obviously big independent, basically. Yeah, they've been around for um, 30, 35 years. But, you know, when you in the music industry tends to focus on, at the moment, majors. Yeah. Um, so talk to us about your time cooking vinyl there, like kind of who are the artists you were working with. Yeah. Um, so artists I was working with at Cooking Vinyl were people like, Passenger, Nina Nesbitt, The Prodigy, The Darkness, uh, Sophie Ellis Baxter. Yeah. Um, yeah, like it was a very, like, varied uh, yeah. pool. Um, and then 
I guess is there any like you've you've worked your your next role was at Island Record <clears throat> Island yeah. Records and before I kind of get into what you did there yeah you've you've sort of looking at your experience you've had times at um, independence and majors you've obviously got Warner Music and Universal mm-hmm. you did as an intern but also had full time roles there as well yeah. uh, but you also had your time at kind of big indies which were Ministry of Sound and Cooking Vinyl. Mm. Um, is there any kind of comparison you can draw in terms of working within a major label setup versus working within an ind- independent? Um, I think the role, I mean, the, the role of like digital marketing ostensibly stays the same, like whether you're a major or an indie, yeah. I think. Like my role, whether you, digital or audience development is always about like, helping artists grow their channels, like finding the best content, working out how to build their mailing list. You know, the, the core of it stays the same. Yeah. I think what changes is the resource and the the way that like, whereas at Cooking Vinyl, I was doing like digital marketing, but also like managing DSP relationships and the pitching process mm-hmm. in, in tandem with like The Orchard. Um, at like Island, they have other teams that, that do all the DSP stuff. So you're kind of, your role becomes more focused. Yeah, I mean, I, I, that, I've heard that before. I mean, I remember particularly when, let's say, if you're a marketing manager at Ministry back in the day, you had to wear many hats where yeah. then you went into a major and they had, you know, your role was split yeah. into four, five, six different roles, totally. basically. And I, I think that, that was actually what I really loved about my time at Cooking Vinyl was that you you do learn so much. Like, yeah. you, you have to do so much. You learn mm. so much. And I think there, there's a there can be an element of that, like, diluting your skill set in certain areas but i actually think like especially like especially with the way the industry's gone in terms of like content creation everything now like i can use premiere pro photoshop CapCut, everything because i was having to do it at final yeah like, yeah yeah because you were forced to do it in a way mm. so i think that has a residual benefit down the line your title at island records are at 2023 now mm. digital innovation and audience lead it's quite a fancy yeah. title isn't it it is a bit yeah what, what did it even <laughs> what did it mean because I mean, I know I can see the audience bit, and I, sure. and I spoke to someone. I think it was Amy Collins actually about digital marketing mm. or di- digital marketing manager, audience manager, mm. and the, well, the difference between those actual roles. And actually, it seems like there's yeah, there's not, not much of a difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, well, like the innovations, another part I've seen in titles cropping mm. up. Um, explain what that title means, and I guess uh, what it involved. Yeah, so th- the innovation part of that role was it it kind of encompassed you know a lot of things like metaverse and ai and gaming and like like i guess things that you might call like non-traditional yeah areas of the digital landscape Mm -hmm. you know you do all the audience stuff on like social crm website etc as i said but like yeah it's like how do we use all these like emerging technologies to to augment artist campaigns um Okay, uh, let, let's let's talk about some of the the campaigns then. I think, um, uh, I mean, b- before we started, there were there were two that we were discussing. Um, yep. There was Hosier, 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 and his uh, and his first number one album. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there was also uh, Nina Nesbit. Mm-hmm. Let's let's focus on Hosier and that first number one album, Unreal, Unearth. Like, I guess, what was it like working on that campaign, and how did you achieve that number one album? Um, yeah, I mean, it was incredible working on it, like such a, such a brilliant, I mean, he's just such a brilliant artist and like has a great team around him. And I think you can, you can feel that through everything he puts out. And so it becomes as, as someone who like works in like an audience development capacity, it becomes very simple to see like what his appeal is to his audience. Um, and then his audience like he he so he before I started had spent a bit of time developing his TikTok audience. Um, he hadn't been on it for a while, and then I think like a year, two years before I, I joined, he was like putting stuff out there. So he had like warming up that TikTok audience, but but hadn't released any music until we started this campaign. And when when we started it, we released um, like we we did all, the whole teasing thing on TikTok, and we kind of released an EP, a three four track EP, yeah. early last year. Um, and the, the title track, Eat Your Young, just flew. I think it's now got like over 150 million streams on Spotify. And it was just like his audience just grabbed it and, and just ran with it. And it became 
very much a, like that thing where you're always trying to like get people to engage yeah was like kind of became removed it was like okay his fan base is just going to take everything that, that, that we kind of put out it's like okay how do we then best augment and, and build the campaign around that because they're so engaged and they just love him so much it was yeah a lot of fun to work on how important is a a number one to artists now whether it be an album or a single i've, I've seen a few articles recently sort of d discussing the 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 uh, charts as an outdated metric mm -hmm. um in in t i mean put it this way like um what would an artist i guess like there's still does it does it have an importance does it have a role to play rather than just an ego thing um you know would an artist yeah. rather have a number one album or half a billion streams <laughs> because you can get to yeah, half yeah, a billion yeah. streams without being in the charts nowadays yeah. um what's your what's your take on both uh, those yeah, points it, it like chart position definitely matters less I, I think it's like the 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 general audience isn't checking who's number one in the charts i think it it, it works more as a uh, probably as, as an industry metric mm. like when you're talking to like press or radio yeah it's, it's it's a it's a good headline and that's not to like belittle it in a way but i think it to like the general consumer it, it isn't that important and i think <clears throat> artists want it but it would to your point would probably rather have <laughs> half a billion streams <laughs> because it will probably give you more money <laughs> but yeah i mean, definitely um that's what i'd have thought anyway but why to the kind of um to your average music fan mm. why does it mean less of a thing now than it used to because I don't know the I um, I, I, I don't know why I, that would I be. I wonder if it's because it used to be a thing of like uh, like the radio. I mean, they just still do the radio countdown, but the, the the chart show used to be a thing, right? What and you was, mean, more of a moment? That was my moment, at the end yeah. of the week, top of the like, pops. Who's number one? And it was like, yeah, okay. And it was, yeah. and and it, it, I think at a time where like the there was more like gatekeepers within music yeah. in a way. It was like the way to find out who like the biggest album was it was like tuning into radio one and, and that was it whereas nowadays it's like there's there's so much music so many ways to find music so many metrics of like success within music mm. and people are consuming it in so many different ways i.e like you know just listening on like youtube or tiktok for instance it, and you know tiktok isn't a metric that gets included in the chart and yeah, it's like yeah, yeah. that's probably more important to like a gen z audience mm. you know because like and also i think it's it like you get a lot of um, like heritage acts who can build up like massive physical pre-orders and, and get high chart positions which is fantastic for them but I think beyond their core fan base probably doesn't um, spread you know as yeah. far yeah 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 okay um, let's go to Nina Nesbitt then yeah the first Metaverse music festival was with Nina Nesbitt is that true yeah so she, she was part of the first music meta, uh, Metaverse music festival um, we worked with a platform called Decentraland uh, this is a cooking vinyl. This is a cooking vinyl. Yeah, yeah. So, so they, they reached out, um, reached out to us to, to to see if she wanted to do it, and um, it just seemed like a great opportunity. It was um, like like Dead Mouse was doing it. He seems to do a lot of the metaverse stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a few other like more digital focused artists. I think weirdly like Paris Hilton was doing like a DJ set, and yeah. then that like DJ era thing okay. she had. Like, it was a weird lineup, but we were like that they wanted us to do it and it felt like a great opportunity and something that she hadn't really touched on before in her career um and she was just game for for getting stuck in so yeah we did uh like two days of mocap um like the whole like abba little yeah. like, ping pong ball suits um over near holborn i think um and they created her avatar um like rendered it all out in this like under the water world thing it was it was kind of crazy um, so the, the, we, I've got a bunch of questions sure. for you, right? One of them was how can artists enhance IRL events with digital magic? Now, yeah. sort of feeds into what we're talking about here. So yeah, for sure. What, what would your take on, on that be, I guess, in terms of blending digital with reality? Yeah, I, I think like the the most success you you can get from that kind of thing is probably from making stuff feel more like eventized and personal. Like if you can, so there's there are companies like uh, like a landmark, for instance, or I think they've changed their name recently, but that like the kind of like geofencing 
like yeah. concept where it's like okay i'm going to do either a show that you like at brixton academy or you're just doing like a pop-up on the street like like to promote your new record and it's like finding ways to like give fans who were there like digital collectibles or items that they can kind of keep and then show off their fandom on like their socials or you know just to create like ugc so that could be like uh you know like filters or you know specific like digital like ticket stubs or do you know what i mean that, that kind of yeah. thing or like or access to like exclusive merch for instance like around those specific shows um i think it's all about finding ways to encourage yeah ugc creation and like letting fans kind of shout about their fandom okay so i've got another question then based on what you're saying there is is it, when you're talking about i guess ultimately when we talk about audience or yeah. building community um what are the what are the key ingredients for a successful artist fan relationship yeah so i think it it's a like uh, one thing i always say when we talk about this is like about making fans feel seen within that that relationship it's like a two-way thing and you want them to make you want them to feel like you're like you, uh, the answers they're giving you if you're asking the question or like just the the sentiment is like being seen and taken on board um like an artist that always gets referenced when you talk about this kind of thing is like Fred again and what he does with his discord and how like effective that is little smirk so <laughs> like, but, but it's true because he's great at it I mean I know he works with, you know he works with like leveler who helped yeah, yeah, with that yeah. but like it, it really is like brilliant the kind of like community he's built and I think it is something that a lot of artists aspire to because it you you give artists a platform and a safe space to like come together talk about what they love about the artist you know oh you're doing some shows okay let the art let the fans like work out where they're going to meet beforehand and, and kind of create like a in real life community, you know, and bring that together. And then that in itself makes brilliant content, right? Because you're like, you know, our fans have like taken over a pub before the show you're yeah. playing that night and that becomes a whole moment in itself. So I think it's about, yeah, definitely like encouraging that two-way conversation, making them feel like they're seen, bringing it into like real life in like tangible ways. Um, and yeah, just like as well, I, th I think like sharing content as well is, is really important that they create. Like in the, um, I think the last dinner party recently did it on, I think they released an acoustic version of their big single, no uh, Nothing Matters. Yeah. And I think the artwork from that is like fan artwork. And it's like really cool that you can kind of incorporate fans into the creative process in that way. Well, that, that kind of, that goes some way to answering the next question, which is, which is, when, when we're talking about digital strategy, mm. how how can artists and and labels win when when it, with digital strategy? Yeah, um, I think a lot of that is, is comes down to like what you're trying to achieve. Um, I, I think it also depends on what what level of artist you're at. Like I, I've done a lot of work with artists where you're talking about like either artists that have like stalled on their social in their social growth and their audience growth, or they're just starting out and they're looking at ways to like build that. And the the way we always start, the way I always start with that that conversation is like, what are you trying to achieve? What's the goal? Like, are you looking to grow your audience? You want to grow your engagement, but like to what end? And then let that inform like, okay, what content. What content are you putting out there? What are you trying to say as an artist? And, and what content do you think fits that brief? And then you create yeah. like three three or four verticals uh, within that, that, you know, whether that's like music performance, lifestyle, or, you know, like behind it, like that kind of thing, like the live live vertical as well. And then you, you really focus on that because I think it, become, it be can become very easy to feel overwhelmed and, you know, kind of unsure where to focus your efforts as an artist and, and as a label as well you know there are so many platforms there are so many things to look at um when you're looking to market an artist and it's like making it kind of reducing that down and focusing focusing on the areas that will really make the difference and so then you make really effective content and you know you you use your analytics you know look at ways you know that free tools exist on all the apps you know you, you look at ways to like iterate and where's your engagement dropping off okay let's flip it, let's change it, let's build something new. And I think in time, you kind of build your own strategy that kind of allows like that to take hold in a way. Yeah, yeah, okay. So I, if I may as well, the other point I was going <laughs> to no, say. No, you may not. <laughs> the other thing I think is like super fans. And engage, right. Like to the point about fan communities as well, it's like, <coughs> it, it, I think there's definitely like uh, super fans are an area that uh, is, is kind of, can be lost a bit, like within... Let, 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 let's let's stay yeah. here. Yeah, okay. It, what is a super fan? Explain that in layman's terms. So a, a super fan is just like someone that will 
buy every album, buy, buy a t-shirt, go to the show, like, you know, just loves, lives and breathes an artist. Yeah. You know, like, a, like a Swifty mm-hmm. would, you know? Yeah, but like, okay. But Swifties extra- are good, yeah. But extrapolate good that across, you know, yeah. any other artist. It's like the absolute... And do you like, think the, the, the super fan has, uh, is, is growing in terms of its importance? Yeah, totally. Because I, 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 there are definitely stats out there, and it, it like escapes me now. But like, where like the the super fans will account for like a significant portion of your overall revenue when you think about like gig tickets and merch, and yeah, that yeah, kind yeah. of stuff. So like, they're absolutely. And I think there's there was a recent like report by by Goldman Sachs saying how they thought that there was a lot of value being left on the table in the super fan conversation mm. because you know they kind of see it as a like potentially there's a future where you can. Uh, have fans pay subscriptions for, for content yeah. from their artists I'm, which, yeah, which yeah, is yeah. like I, I, I'm in like two minds about that I'm not, I'm not sure if that's the thing well I, I'd heard of that in the capacity of um, I think it was taking like a service like Spotify for example mm. and you know let's say you pay your how much is it a month now 50, 10, 10 15 10, 9, 9. I can't keep up um, I, think, I don't know. Depends what plan you're on, I guess. Yeah, I guess. Um, but taking your whatever your the standard monthly premium plan is. Yeah. But then paying five pound extra a month for exclusive content by Taylor Swift. Mm. That sounded interesting to me. Um, yeah. Could that work? Um. I, yeah, I, I guess. Like, I, I why mean, wouldn't it? it? Well. <sighs> I, I think it depends. You really have to give value for what you're paying for. Oh, sure. If, if, yeah, you're, yeah. Pay, if you're paying £10 a month for Spotify, which is every song that's ever existed. Yeah. And then you're saying to me, for, 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 for even if you pay like two quid a month. Yeah, yeah. For a fifth of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I get you. Do you but, know what I mean? But my point to that is, is like, yeah, there's your fee for everything. Mm. But if you're a super fan, yeah. like paying £2 or £5 a month when you're happy to pay £100 yeah. quid for a ticket to see them live. Yeah. Is, is a fraction yeah, of the I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying it's not possible. Like 100, 100%, I think well. that there's a market for that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I just think it. I, I think it's important. I, I, I feel a bit iffy talking about it sometimes because yeah. it feels like you're just trying to like extract more money from people in a way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, it, it, there's definitely a market for it. I just think it, it is yet to be seen whether it can be done in a way that is like equitable. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but you, you know, you look in like like Korea and like like Asian markets where they have stuff like Weverse and mm. that kind of thing. Like they they're like nailing it so yeah. there's no reason why it couldn't come over this way okay well i mean in terms of we've, we've talked about navigating uh i guess socials if you like and and we're, we're talking now sort of you know one idea in terms of streaming strategy but like i guess when it comes to dsps how how do artists and labels navigate the s- s- streaming services or dsps mm. today yeah i think I, do you know what i think people are becoming less and less um, fixated on the idea of like playlists as being the be all and end all. And it, it kind of, you, you take a step back in a way and it's like, how do we drive active streams? How do we drive our audience from social to DSP to drive active streams, which will then make the case for you to be added to like those, the flagship playlists. And I think that that is more and more becoming the, the, the approach that like labels are taking. Explain what, an active stream is so active stream is where someone is so i'm going to spotify and i'm like searching for an artist and listening from their profile like i'm I'm actively seeking out the track rather than a passive stream would be putting on a playlist and just letting it play in the background yeah and then i'm just like not yeah, yeah you know yeah, paying yeah. attention to who's playing in that sense okay so it, yeah the the active is like the active part is really important because it shows that you've you've got an audience that are like specifically looking to listen to your music so is that what you're saying is is that's the that's what's necessary to kind of get to your home well i don't know if it is the holy grail but the get to those today's top hits type playlists yeah for sure i think, I think that there are like you, you know dsps will be looking for like markers uh within active streams to be like okay this track's like flying and it's because not because we've put it in loads of playlists it's because they've got an audience that's come to spotify to yeah to listen to it um and and you know likewise when you look at like TikTok and TikTok creates that is very much like an active yeah. engagement metric where it's like okay these people aren't just like listening to the track and swiping up they're like listening and then they're creating something from it and as we know the relationship between you know TikTok creates and active streams on Spotify is very much like yeah. a positive correlation so um, yeah more so and I, more looking at that 
when you're talking when we're talking about yeah i guess navigating dsps today then mm. like would you say would you say that then what you're doing with your digital strategy mm. is effectively your streaming strategy yeah to an extent yeah i, th I think it it, it be because of I, I i can't think of another like platform that has had like such a clear um like I say, positive correlation as yeah. TikTok and like streaming, right? Yeah, like yeah. if you get your TikTok strategy right, chances are your streaming strategy will follow. And it, it's in if the strategy is all about you know driving active streams, which it is, then I think the best place to start is always going to be building your audience and growing your audience. And so you know, I asked this, that across. I asked this question uh, last week or in the last episode, I should say. Mm. Um, does TikTok? Mm. drive streams on platforms like Spotify. I asked that exact question last episode. What's, what's your response to that? Does TikTok drive streams on Spotify? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Simple as. Yeah, yeah. I and, mean, we've, and we've, do, we've and seen do you happen, think, yeah. And do you think that that's like, obviously there's, yes, but there's different levels. It's yeah. like, yeah, you know, it's it, absolutely, without TikTok, we're lost on Spotify or is no, it No, like, it's not. It's, is it like, I guess my, really my point is, is has the, um, the impact that spot, uh, TikTok allegedly had when we were mm. talking yesteryear before mm. in term, it was so, it was so crucial to your, mm. I guess your overall strategy, mm. uh, where people are chasing viral moments and whatnot, mm. because they deemed that TikTok was, was, I guess, generating all these streams is that still the case in 2024 yeah i i, I think like i mean it's things change and I, it might not be as crucial as it was like a year ago but there's still a very clear like relationship between you know if your track whether it's catalog or, new, or frontline kind of takes off on tiktok like that more often that than not will translate mm. like that's just that we, we see that time and time again in, in the data do you see that changing um, anytime soon not not at the minute not imminently not imminently yeah like but but that being said to your earlier point like it, it, you know it's also not the be all and end all like i like i, I always stress to artists it's like you don't ignore other platforms just because everyone says you should be doing stuff on tiktok like that's why you know you've got reels now you've got youtube shorts now like mm. th th those platforms should also be part of your whole <laughs> strategy Okay, um, I've got to ask you about AI as well. I, I'm bored. I'm bored of it, but I am <laughs> sure. going to ask you. Sure. Um, how how do you think AI is impacting music creation and music marketing? Yeah, I, I think the like the, a big thing with AI is like the personalization aspect, both in terms of like the creation of, of music and kind of surrounding assets and then also like how you speak to fans so, so like, give so, as an example yeah so with, with the creation thing like um there was an example from last year an artist called lauv um released a new single and then collaborated with an ai startup and a korean pop artist um to basically i think the, the korean artist translated the single into korean and then sung it and then they put that artist's voice through the ai like mental voice filter to make yeah. it sound like Lauv okay singing in Korean and then they released that yeah uh, as a single on DSPs which is yeah kind of mind-blowing but yeah. you know you can see how that kind of thing will work really well across like you know I, I mean thinking about you know massive frontline artists who are huge in like Asia like yeah that, yeah, that, yeah. that would be massive and also you can extrapolate that into like official music video content so if you have like, I don't know, like a Dua Lipa, for instance, and you want to make her video in like Mandarin or something yeah. and like with the way that that voice tech goes and with like the experimentation that like you see streaming services doing with like deep fake tech. Yeah, like, yeah, like, yeah. You yeah. could feasibly have like a Dua Lipa singing in Mandarin. Yeah, yeah, And yeah, then you yeah, release yeah. that video and like... I mean, we're very close. We're, we're not, I kind of feel like we're there already. It's get, like, it like, but like in terms of it being like widespread. Yeah, like, sure. Being, being able to like connect yeah. with their audiences yeah. quite like directly. Like that, that's really exciting. Mm. Um, but I guess, I, well, I guess my point, I feel like the technology's there, but yeah. perhaps the uh, the utilisation of that technology perhaps totally. isn't happening yeah, to, yeah. to the extent it should. I, I think it's still like people use, the artists use AI and it is still like very much like a headline. You yeah. see it in like like the trade press are like yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. artists this AI thing. It's like okay, that's cool, but like once you normalize it and it actually becomes just a way to like 
you know, create like real connections with fans across the world. I think that's really cool. Okay. Anything else? I think there's like also just, I mean, in terms of like the marketing side, other ways that, that AI could, you know, could conceivably be used is plugging into stuff like community management and, and Discord. If, you know, if you have an artist who is like touring and, you know, you can feed their messages that are like location, weather, time specific. Um, once those artists are in that, those specific markets, then that kind of creates so many more opportunities for like, you know, engaging and, and direct messaging. And it takes, you know, that would be a lot of work otherwise. So yeah. it kind of takes all of that and makes it much more streamlined and, and, and simpler. Sweet. Okay. Well, we're pretty much there, mate, at the end. Uh, yeah. there's, there's just one... There's two questions I've got for you before we wrap up. Okay. That is, who is... You've had a kind of quite a long career in the music industry. Yeah. Who's the fa- who's the kind of your favourite person that you've worked with? Uh, I d- and I don't want to... Uh, mentor is what we've, <laughs> we've said, but yeah, like, yeah. Who, who is that person? Um, I think I've always got a shout out Rob Watson. Yes. From Ministry. Fucking love Rob Watson. Rob's a legend. <laughs> Rob Rob was my first like so Ministry was my first ever like proper like full time job. Like yeah. no, no, no no like short term thing. And Rob was my manager. Uh, and yeah, he was just brilliant. Top like, guy. And always just like st- stuff he told me then, still to this day. Quality. Know. Okay. And I guess in, in terms of advice, like give given, given all your experience and, and everything you've learned. If you could pass on one bit of advice, uh, I guess to, to to someone coming up in the in the industry, what what would that be? Um, one bit of advice. What like are we talking like career or just like how, doing a job kind of thing? Goes to, <laughs> goes hand in hand for me. <laughs> no, I know, but like I mean, I, like I, I, I don't. Uh, there's no. I don't have a. Spe- I would say, look, put it this way: if you've got someone that's trying to break through into the into the music industry, yeah, what are you telling them? Yeah. Like, you know, in the yeah, same yeah, way yeah. that, you know, there was Rob and you had maybe someone to look up to and there was things you learned, yeah. what advice would you give to someone? I think like, okay, so if, if you're just coming through the door in, into the industry, like I would always say just like show your passion and, and put the time in to like learn and, and be be um, be proactive, be keen, like and show that to people because books, people notice that, you mm-hmm. know, and, and it, it whenever the people always the people who are like best in the team especially in the teams that i've managed or worked in it's like those who you know will like go above and beyond and not, not in a way that's like oh they're gonna be working till like 10 p.m it's like when they're in the office they're always just like on it and like that goes a long way because people see that and are like that person's like switched on and, and wants to be here and wants to like put in a shift yeah um which I think always gets noticed. Definitely, definitely. Um, okay, well, listen, mate, thank you. Thank you very much for coming on. Um, no stress. Uh, you know, I think with some definitely some important questions that you've <laughs> answered there, uh, pretty much. Um, yeah, and, you know, you've, you've always kind of been top of your game in this digital world, and I know you're kind of doing your consultancy thing now as well. So, yeah, man, nice one. Thank you, mate. Appreciate it.